So I'll talk about uh, humanism um, and cooperative governance. Let me just make sure that I can move the slides. So just give me a second. Yeah, all right. So I'll give you some a bit of a background as to why it is I'm speaking about this topic. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, humanistic economics and management as the theoretical uh, basis for uh, the, the way we are approaching cooperative governance. Um, I'll speak about contingent cooperative governance. In other words, there isn't you know, one, one type that fits all. And I will be talking about the next steps uh, in this project that, that you'll hear from me about. Um, before I continue, um, can you all see just my PowerPoint? Lori, can you tell me if only the PowerPoints are visible? Uh, the slide up on the screen? Or are you seeing any other commands? We can, I can see you in a little window. I imagine people will position Not you. me, but the, the PowerPoint, because yeah, there's- we, the, the PowerPoint okay. is filling so the screen. commands from Zoom that are popping up on my screen, you cannot see those. Um, no, I can see what people are putting in chat. Um, okay, good. So it's, it's, not, it's not distracting you from seeing the slides. All right, good, yeah. thank you. All right, so this is my layout uh, for today. And uh, so here, here goes the background. Um, I'm sure you all uh, in the cooperative movement are familiar with the blueprint for the cooperative decade. Uh, that came out, uh, well, 2012 was the UN uh, year of, co of cooperatives. In 2013, I believe the blueprint came out and it talked about five pillars um, and there was uh, a participation pillar. Others were sustainability, capital, uh, law, uh, and I can't remember what the, uh, the last one was, the, uh, the identity, of course. Um, and so uh, after the blueprint, there were uh, follow-up publications by the International Cooperative Alliance. And uh, in my International Center for Co-op Management at St. Mary's University, uh, we have uh, produced the uh, publication called Co Cooperative Governance uh, Under Complexity in 2015. Uh, I have co-edited this with my colleague, Karen Miner. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, we started thinking about cooperative governance with this uh, humanism in mind as the background rather than uh, economic theories of agency. Um, so I'll speak to those theories uh, just briefly in a bit. And in 2019, we were lucky to uh, partner up with the Catholic University of Leuven uh, project. Uh, Frederic Dufay is, is our colleague there coordinating the project. There are six research pillars and at some areas we have one. We are uh, looking at developing humanistic cooperative governance frameworks, so a little bit of theory but also of course practical implications and uh, there are uh, as I said five other projects looking at uh, the impacts of internal and external factors on, uh, on cooperative governance. And those five pillars are uh, situated at the Center of Expertise for Cooperative Entrepreneurship at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. So uh, we've embarked on this just recently. There are PhD students participating in it. And at St. Mary's, uh, our third partner in crime, so besides myself and Karen, uh, is uh, Kian McMahon. He's our researcher from Ireland uh, who is stuck in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, Canada for the duration of COVID uh, ban on travel. So uh, Kian is here in Halifax, but usually would spend his summers in Ireland, which this summer is not going to be the case. Anyway, so the three of us are here and uh, we have many of uh, some of you on the call here, but many others who are contributing and talking to us about uh, cooperative governance and uh, lending us your expertise uh, on the ground uh, because we are going to be tackling some case studies. So this is uh, the picture of the, the background I just uh, summarized. The blueprint, uh, the guidance notes on, on uh, the cooperative principles was another publication that came out in 2015. And if you haven't familiarized yourself with it, I would strongly recommend that you do because it's a great publication that explains uh, in detail the intent behind the, the, the principles of cooperation 
And so we are following that understanding of cooperative enterprise pretty closely. Uh, our Co-op Governance Fit to Build Resilience in the Face of Complexity publication is here pictured on the right. And we were quite inspired by uh, the booklet uh, of Sean Turnbull, A New Way to Govern. Uh, Sean talks about uh, network governance. So this is the, the background to, to our work. <clears throat> so when we talk about governance, what we mean is Here's a little bit of a definition, right? To steer, set rules, be in charge of the power. Uh, governance is related to vision, decision-making processes, power dynamics and accountability in organizations. And the ultimate goal of governance in organizations is to effectively fulfill the goals of the organization in a way consistent with its purpose. So the purpose of the organization is really critically important. Uh, and in our, in our understanding of cooperatives, that cooperative purpose is really key, of course, uh, to everything we do and how we structure our decision making as well. The purpose of the organization is different from the means to achieve, right? So if you want, for example, to change the world, that's your purpose, <laughs> but uh, you may do it in different ways. Um, so the start to our um, discussion about what should be the elements, or what are the elements of cooperative governance, we needed to uh, nail down or drill down the key differentiators of cooperative enterprise. So we usually go from the statement of cooperative identity, we talk about principles and values, but really the nuts and bolts of the, the, the essence of, of the difference in the cooperative enterprise are really these three inherent properties. One that is humanistic, uh, humanism drives cooperatives, meaning that it's a people-centered approach. So capital is secondary. It is absolutely um, a, an instrumental input, but it is uh, secondary to the people. So it's a subordinate factor in production. But there is joint ownership and control of the enterprise. So members collectively, jointly own and control cooperatives. And that is, again, a unique feature uh, together with people-centeredness and democracy. So this is about self-governance in a democratic fashion. Um, so those are the three inherent properties. And so we chart a little model of the cooperative enterprise. You see the triangle with those three points uh, at, the, at, at each of the peaks. So joint ownership and control, people-centeredness, again, as opposed to being centered on capital and capital ownership, and democracy. This is the way to actually make decisions. So what democracy means and how it's deployed dif differs, and this is what we'll be talking about. Um, so this is a simple schematic of the cooperative enterprise. Of course, it is embedded in the economy. That's the economic uh, the purpose of the enterprise. Uh, of course, uh, the inside of the triangle, which I didn't mention, is the purpose of the cooperative enterprise with its values and principles as defined by the statement of the cooperative identity uh, of the International Cooperative Alliance and embeddedness of the economy into society and the environment uh, is uh, the, obvious, the obvious way to describe the functioning of an enterprise. So what was driving our thinking here is then how do these core characteristics of the cooperative inform governance practices in cooperatives? And are those governance practices undermining the cooperative identity or are they strengthening the cooperative identity? So because uh, oftentimes governance practices, structures, uh, you know, decision-making bodies are structured uh, with the best in the industry, uh, in mind or with mimic, mimicking the corporate governance practices, um, at times those governance setups are actually not helping the cooperative nature. So that's what we want to explore. We look at different governance theories, of course, and there are many, uh, but the key ones on the two ends of the spectrum uh, that uh, many of you will be familiar with are the principal agent theory, that's coming from economics and the assumptions of neoclassical economics. Um, 
where the, the, the route to the principal agent relationship is the separation of ownership and control. So the owner, who is the principal, hires the agent, manager, right, CEO, um, who actually controls the enterprise. So it's the executive power, has the executive power and controls the operations of the enterprise. But the agent, in economic theory, is an opportunist. Uh, there is selfish, self-centered, utility maximizing or profit maximizing behavior and opportunism that has to be curbed by the controller. Uh, in this case, uh, this would be the board of directors that's representing the owners and the job is actually to make sure that the manager behaves, right? Uh, the incentives are offered to the manager to align with the owner's interests and uh, usually that is about financial success. Note that I'll be talking about CEO and manager, even though in cooperatives, uh, the terms may not directly apply. It may be the executive team, it may be the manager, whatever it is. But when I say CEO or manager, that's, that's what I mean. Whoever is the executive, whoever has the executive power. So, um, so this is the principal agent theory. And the role of the board in this case, and in the governance literature, mostly what you get, what you see is the debates about the role that the board has to, the functions of the board of directors, right? And so this would be the conformance role as uh, Chris Comfort refers to um, in his writing. Uh, so this is, you know, the, 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 again, monitoring and control by the board to make sure that the manager delivers on the wishes of the owners uh, of the enterprise. The other end of the spectrum is the stewardship uh, model or stewardship theory. And in that case, uh, the understanding of human behavior is that it aligns with the values of the enterprise, that CEO's interest is aligned, um, that uh, the reputation of the enterprise, the CEO sees the reputation of the enterprise as his or her own, and therefore is fully, uh, the interest of the enterprise and success of the enterprise is also CEO's goal and wish, right? Um, this is rooted in, in other kind of, kinds of thinking about human behavior, sociology and psychology driven. And here the board's role is different and it is to support and advise the CEO uh, and not to confront or control the person, right? So it's really to provide expertise and provide advice. Um, so this is more of a performance role, right? Strategy, focus on strategy more so than on control. However, monitoring and control as the board's role is often uh, what you see in the literature. There are many other, so these are the two theories on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Stewardship would be considered to be a humanistic theory, right? Because it's rooted in human behavior and, and, and human dignity. Um, but uh, so, so the two opposite ends are, the difference is also in micro behavioral assumptions. It, what, you know, how human beings behave and what drives them what incentives drive their behaviors uh, is what's, uh, what's uh, inherently different in the two theories. There are other theories that lie in between. Um, there is the stakeholder theory that's also relevant for uh, cooperatives and for network governance that I'll be mentioning a bit later, uh, Sean Turnbull's. There is also the resource dependency theory where the board's role is actually to, uh, to get access to their networks and resources of all sorts. There's managerial dominance theory, uh, trusteeship theory, and so on. So boards in, in the nonprofit literature, boards are also advisory boards, and on it goes. So there are plenty of, of different takes on what the board's role is, uh, but most of the literature really boils down to the board of directors and you know, how, to, uh, how to get the right kind of directors, what relationships should be on the board, training of the board, and so on. Uh, on COP, um, on the cooperative side of things, um, there have been, the literature goes into uh, a, 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 an appreciation or understanding of some dualities in, uh, in the enterprise and uh, presumed tensions as a result of that. Those dualities are uh, between cooperatives being an association of members in the sense that they have, members have to make democratic decisions together versus run an enterprise. There is individual interest of cooperative members versus a collective interest and benefit, right? As a group of people acting together. There is the owner status of 
the cooperative member because members own the business, but they also use the business. By the user, uh, what we mean is both you can work in an enterprise and consider it your, as a worker, be the user of the assets of the enterprise, if you will, uh, the user status of a consumer, the user status of a producer who is selling and supplying products to the, to the, uh, to the cooperative and so on. So th there is a transaction as well, besides owning uh, the co-op collectively, there is the transactional aspect of it as well. So that there is a tension between those two. Uh, social versus economic entities, social versus economic goals. Some cooperatives clearly pursue social goals uh, and others look like they're pursuing economic goals more, more so. Uh, then there's democracy versus hierarchy. How do you marry the two? Uh, there is, there, you know, papers have been written about democratic hierarchies actually uh, to be cooperative. And alternative uh, enterprise versus mainstream. So many cooperatives, cooperative leaders will say, well, we're just a business. We should not be looked at any differently. However, there are those in the cooperative movement who think of themselves as an alternative view, way to actually run an economy or run an enterprise. So because of those dualities, um, often cooperative governance theories talk about democracy, of course, and um, specifically the uh, representation of member interests, right? So how do you run an enterprise democratically and make sure that you represent member interests? So this representation aspect is important. But then if you have a lay board, which is proper, proper representation, uh, there is a challenge with expertise. And this, these have been the debates in the cooperative literature. Uh, how do you ensure there's a right expertise on the board? How can the board uh, do its job and serve its purpose, especially when it's perceived to be a controlling and mo monitoring purpose, right, and job of the board. How can you do that when you have a lay board with uh, possibly directors who really are not uh, up to snuff on uh, the challenges of, of a complex business? And so uh, what we see uh, in the literature on cooperative governance is this paradox approach. Both Chris Comfort wrote about it, that there's a whole, there's a whole school of the paradox a governance, uh, uh, you know, the, the paradox literature in management and governance, uh, management problem or so. And there uh, in the paradox approach to governance of cooperatives, um, the board roles are perceived to be both to control and to support management. So both sides of that end of the spectrum, both, both ends of the spectrum have to be represented. And this is seen to be of course, uh, there's a tension between it and between those uh, sorry goals, and uh, therefore it's, there is a paradox. So you have to be a controlling and supporting board. You have to represent members and provide expertise. And there is this performance role uh, and performance focus as well. Okay. Um, so uh, the this is the, the picture of the power hierarchy. Uh, in, in this uh, context. So you have members who elect the board of directors and the board of directors selects and monitors the CEO. And then in cooperative literature, cooperative governance literature, usually we see a discourse about this voice, making sure that members actually have a voice and have a way to, um, to, to well, to voice their opinions, obviously. Um, that they have proper representation and that proper expertise is also present uh, at the board. So the implicit assumption in this take on governance is that members control power is based on the ownership rights. And the board's power is delegated to them by the members, right? The CEO has the executive power. Uh, and that uh, behind all this, there is a separation of ownership from control of the enterprise. Right? So owners, in the case of co-ops, are members and control is in the hands of the executive, uh, the manager or CEO. And therefore, you will often see recommended practices to make sure that there's a clear line between governance and management. As some of you will know on this call, uh, that is not always the best advice and that is not always the case in cooperatives. And particularly, I would argue, 
this isn't quite clear cut in uh, smaller cooperatives and in worker cooperatives as well. So, so these rules of governance and best practices are not always conducive to uh, the people uh, in, 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 the, in the mix. Um, so it makes sense for some and not for all. All right, so now we go to humanistic theories that drew our attention. And um, uh, basically we look at two, uh, two historical uh, approaches, if you will, uh, to, to theories of humanism in economics and business. Humanistic economics um, has been written basically quite prevalent and quite present in 1970s and 80s, um, where basically the premise of humanistic economics, countering neoclassical economics focused on investment uh, and ownership of, of capital, um, humanistic economics was focused on people. And the uh, basic premise is that people are not commodities and that labor workers, working people, have priority in an enterprise that it's people who make decisions and that they, people cannot be owned by the owner of capital. So although people sign contracts and take a wage, this wage contract is not, uh, is, 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 doesn't um, stop human beings from being responsible and accountable for their own decisions, right? So there is this labor versus capital debate in this literature um, and uh, labor owns the capital. So employee ownership is really the key, uh, the key the, the, most of the discourse key uh, premise is on employee ownership. So worker, there's a distinction, clear distinction between worker cooperatives versus capital shareholding. So even when you have an uh, ESOP or other forms of employee ownership, um, it is not the same. Worker cooperatives, the right uh, is personal right and it's not the property right, right? So your voice is a personal right. Um, and so th that distinction is clearly made. Um, I have a whole list of references that I can share with any of you who are interested, but Lux and Lutz, uh, Tomer would be people who, who wrote uh, a lot in this, uh, in this tradition and David Ellerman uh, on employee ownership and this uh, wage uh, contract. And then, uh, more recently, at least in my knowledge, or to my knowledge, humanistic management literature uh, has become more prevalent uh, as humanistic economics uh, weird off into really social economics uh, field. And humanistic management is um, picking up on, on this uh, human dignity aspect of, of humanism in economics, right? So um, human rights and human dignity at the core but it extends human dignity to all stakeholder relations in, in, with the enterprise. So this is extended to consumers, to producers, and to workers. So all uh, strategic stakeholders, so to speak. The, uh, so it, it includes companies that promote human dignity, um, that pursue well-being rather than uh, monetary gain, right? And ownership type in this literature is not relevant, although often, the examples that they use actually are cooperatives, uh, but that is not emphasized at all uh, in, in the writing. So um, this is what we have been looking at and have been inspired by. Uh, so the humanistic economics, as I said, this is the Lutz and Lux book, and then humanistic management, there's a whole network and the field of research uh, in, this, in this line of thinking. Um, in the definition of humanistic management is that it's the process of achieving organizational objectives by working through, with, and for people in order to achieve the integral human development of members of the work community. So they do go into the work community and understand that work is uh, really where human dignity uh, is at, you know, on display and uh, contribute to the common good of society. So there is that aspect of the contribution to the common good, right? Whereas in humanistic economics, we were just talking about the inside and labor relation, you know, relation to, in relation to labor, the external uh, aspect was not so, uh, so well defined. But uh, the humanistic management literature does that uh, and looks at the contribution to the common good. And as I said, not to the return on uh, investment. 
So what we do is we merge really those two understandings and we look at well-being as a goal, but uh, we also recognize the need of workers' autonomy uh, in, the, in the concept of humanism uh, in organizations, right? So it's about treating people with dignity regardless of their role with the enterprise and with the organization. So it's about, again, all those values of cooperation that we all are familiar with, fair, equitable, just, right? Regarding people as uh, workers, consumers, or producers. Um, the, in this line of thinking of uh, humanist, humanistic man management, in the uh, humanistic management literature in the background, Sean Turnbull um, has been writing about the network governance, which is humanistic governance approach. And um, his uh, take on it is, well, first of all, the microeconomic assumptions are, uh, as in humanistic economics uh, literature, that it's the people are boundedly rational. They're not fully rational. Information is also limited. Um, people have limited ability to process or store information. This comes again from psychology as well, literature and psychology. Um, so we have limited ability to process the information. We all have biases in what we hear in a conversation. So one person uh, cannot be trusted just from, from, from the simple limitations of, of human capacity to process or store information. And so uh, the problem that Turnbull is, is highlighting is that in, all organiz in most organizations, we're talking about a board or the board of directors, one unitary board. So he's saying that unitary boards, single places of decision-making and control cannot be the best way to govern because risk cannot be controlled by a group of, of directors who actually have very limited information, uh, limited ability to process everything that's happening. The more complex the organization, the less likely it is that they are actually going to be guided by proper uh, set of information that they need to have. And so it's no wonder that governance fails and that, especially in the controlling function, um, you know, you, you cannot expect the board to be able to control a CEO who actually has more information than they do. Um, and so remedies, according to Turnbull, are the, the, to design governance through multiple compound boards and engage multiple stakeholders. So what this means is that decisions are made at different uh, nodes in the organization, in sociocratic structures. Those of you familiar with sociocracy will know there are different circles, that each circle, it could be departments, if you will, if an or in an organization, right? That they make decisions and are empowered to make decisions that are relevant to them. And they are then represented uh, on on the board. Uh, the uh, supervisory boards are always, so double boards are always better than having just one. And uh, those different ways to actually uh, ensure accountability are always better than having unitary boards. So this is what Turnbull mostly talks about in his writing. Um, the multi-stakeholder engagement, the more voices are heard from different perspectives of engagement with the enterprise, the better, because again, more informed the decisions will be and checks and balances at human scale. So people will, who engage with the enterprise are able to process uh, you know, information that, that concerns them, but human scale is important. So he basically suggests that 150 people should be the maximum uh, on any of those boards uh, or any of those committees or <laughs> groups, right? So that no, no more than 150 people should be making decisions um, in, in an organization. Of course, uh, we all know that even 20 is too many uh, in some instances. But 150 is his numbers, his number for the organization. Um, okay, cooperative governance. Um, okay, so for us then, um, coming from the background I just uh, laid out, um, for us on this project, the questions are, how is human dignity democratic control in cooperatives and engagement of members and stakeholders safeguarded in co-ops as people-centered organizations? So do we care for human dignity and in what ways? How is democratic control happening? And do we engage stakeholders in cooperatives and to what extent? Um, 
in particular for stakeholder engagement, when you have cooperatives whose members are consumers or producers, the question is, do they involve workers in any of the decision making and how, right? That's usually where, where the nuts and bolts of this are. Um, okay, so to us, the governance is about structures, so formal structures, processes, formal or informal, uh, and then the dynamics between them, right? So what are the structures that cooperatives put together, what processes of decision-making are uh, members involved in, and how does cooperative organization change over time? What dynamics between structures and processes um, happens in, in the organization? Um, so we decided that there is no one answer, right? That it's actually quite complicated and complex, and that when we talk about cooperative governance, we cannot be talking about the cooperative governance. There'll be multiple ways to do this. And then we decided to look at, okay, what will be impacting how governance is structured, what decision-making committees, forums, uh, you know, stru structures, uh, rules, policies, what's going on will depend on a number of things. And so we want to lay out what are those things that are kind of the most obvious to us. And those structures and processes of decision-making then, therefore, we uh, claim, depend definitely on the membership type. So again, instead of talking about co-op governance in general, we believe we need to talk about cooperative governance in worker co-ops, co cooperative governance in consumer co-ops, co-op governance in producer co-ops, and there will be key differences between them. Um, this is partly the reason why uh, that you have members who are insiders or you have members who are outsiders to the organization. So if you have a worker uh, cooperative, right? So the purpose of membership is one thing, which I'll, I'll say a little bit more about in a minute. But if workers are members of a cooperative, they are insiders in the organization. They're very close to uh, the decision making every day. Right? And this insider status gives them the right information, usually, not always, but usually it does. There is no separation between ownership and control. So all of this controlling the manager and so on doesn't really apply in those cases. And what the, um, you know, what and how worker members engage in decision making will be different than if they were not inside the organization all the time. Um, so this insider or outsider status matters. And if you have consumer co-ops who are just buying uh, from the cooperative on occasion uh, in competitive markets, for example, it may be that you shop at the co-op very rarely. Uh, in other markets, you may do it more often. So the stake is very low or, or a bit higher, but not as high as if you are a worker in a cooperative. And that matters in what structures make sense, what representation, what democracy, you know, what democratic processes, how democracy works will be very different uh, in, those, in those two scenarios. And of course, in many others, it will be uh, further differentiated. Another uh, factor that is going to structure or that is going to uh, cause differences in the structure and process of decision making is the purpose of the enterprise. So what breaks and controls members will want to have uh, or will want to introduce will depend on what is, you know, why, what, what's the per what is the, the enterprise doing? What is the purpose? In some cases, it is common good, social purpose, but in other cases, it's very much a financial aspect that matters to members. So depending on what matters, they will hire managers that fit the description and then how they engage and what structures they put in place is going to be uh, quite different. Um, the stage in the life cycle, whether it's a startup, so you have a few members who are just starting up, uh, what they do and how they make decisions, uh, how they strategize is going to be very different than if this is a growing, uh, it's a little bit further down in the life cycle or a mature cooperative that actually is uh, figuring out what its strategy is going to be for the coming you know, 10, 20, 50 years. So it, the stage in the life cycle 
uh, is definitely a decisive, a decisive factor in how, you know, what kind of governance uh, structures and processes are put in place and how change happens. The um, size of the cooperative uh, may be obviously correlating with the uh, stage in the life cycle, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, so the size of a co-op may be very, very small. Worker cooperatives tend to be smaller. And again, the importance of this uh, scale, human scale, is uh, very obvious in worker cooperatives. The size becomes quite huge in consumer co-ops, and that imposes a whole other challenge, right? So, and so governance structures cannot be the same, and they're not the same <laughs> when cooperatives are small or large. Um, the next factor, contingency factor, I actually have two together. Um, the non-member stakeholders and how the cooperative deals with non-member stakeholders. In some instances, we don't care to include them. In others, we do. Um, and uh, in some cases, you have this, uh, you know, the notion of co-creation, especially in consumer co-ops, where consumers, in co-op cases, members, actually are invited to create products, services with the enterprise. Uh, the, you know, co-creation of, of, of products and services is uh, a strategy for, uh, you know, corporations as well. But with cooperatives, that is their advantage, really, because the consumers are your members and they are the owners who should make that decision. So how well that's done and what structures are in place to do it uh, is absolutely um, different, <clears throat> you know, depending on what are those non-member stakeholders well, who are the members, but also which non-member stakeholders are engaged and how. And uh, competition, regulation, legal context, of course, all of those matter. Um, you know, many things have to happen and we have them because the law says so. But even where the law says you have to have a board um, or the board, right? You can always do things differently. Um, and, and that's exactly what happens depending on, uh, on the type, as, as we said. Map, the type of member is key. Um, whether that's an insider or an outsider, why the enterprise exists to begin with, and then is it small, is it large, is it new, or is it growing, uh, or is it in a crisis after many years uh, in existence? So this, this is how we're taking uh, contingency and contingent governance in a cooperative context. And so we get down to what is governance? Uh, what does governance systems comprise of? I mentioned it already a number of times. So co-op governance is democratic governance. What is it about? Well, it's about the structures of governance. So this is the boards, the committees, the, the rules, the regulations, right? The processes, uh, how we engage in this democratic process and dynamics is what, how do changes happen? Uh, what, what's, at, you know, what's at work uh, to, to actually see changes in the organization? So on the structure side, I'm out now going to outline briefly what is the structure, what is the process, and what are the dynamics um, that we have started to look at. So those structures, uh, number one is the ownership. Um, and on the ownership, um, really, the ownership is, is sometimes uh, poorly understood in cooperatives. It is, this is in the guidance notes on the, on the cooperative enterprise, uh, the ICA guidance notes that I mentioned. Uh, it's well described there. So um, the usership, we include labor, as I said already. So it's either you're a worker or you're a producer or you're a consumer and you're engaged with the, with, and you own the enterprise, you're a member. So these members have, uh, uh, well, any ownership right really can be broken down into three aspects. One is to use the assets. The other, another is to benefit or profit from the assets. So usus, fructus, and abusus. Usus is you use the assets. Fructus is you benefit from them or profit from them, and abusus is you can dispose of them. So the use and benefit is what uh, cooperative members have the personal right. So it's a personal right to use and benefit from the enterprise, and disposal is a collective right in uh, cooperatives. So members own control and benefit from the enterprise, but because it's joint ownership, the disposal of, of the assets is a collective decision. Um, the second aspect of structures is the uh, decision-making 
bodies. So this is, do you have a board? Do you have supervisory and executive board? Do you have, uh, you know, three layers of, of, of board decisions? Do you have committees? Uh, sometimes you have board committees, but what, when I say committees, I mean are committees of members actually making any decisions, maybe advising the board, but, you know, it's not board committees that are usually uh, struck, but member committees. Um, and oftentimes in cooperatives, it's not just members, but it's also staff. If these are non, non-worker co-ops, um, then also workers uh, are engaged with, with committees. So what sorts of decision-making bodies are out there? Um, and the uh, third aspect are, well, the constitution or the bylaws, right? Rules and policies. So members from the get-go set up the rules, the policies, the bylaws following, of course, the legal requirements and so on, but these rules are changing as cooperative members change and as the cooperative uh, engages in different stages of, of its life, life cycle. Um, democratic processes are different ways that members engage with the decision-making in the cooperative. So we could have direct uh, democracy, direct engagement, or there could be representative democracy. Direct democracy is more likely in smaller and in worker cooperatives. Representative democracy is more likely in large and in consumer or producer co-ops. Voice is a personal right. It's not a property right. So that's the differentiator of co-ops from uh, uh, capital-owned businesses. You can have a majority vote as a rule. You can have a consensus as a rule of decision-making. There could be a consent decision-making, which is the case with sociocracy, dynamic governance. Uh, we could have informal processes. Uh, you know, we could have straw votes when we're voting, which is, for example, in my department, that's what we do. We always have a straw vote. It's not written anywhere that we should, but that's how we've been doing it. Um, Facilitation is definitely something that uh, collectives use in making decisions and in sociocracy, it's a mandatory aspect, which I think is really clever. Um, and then there's governance review processes that happen and those tend to be quite interesting and elaborate in large uh, and even second tier co-ops. Um, so that's something to take a look at. Um, so here I'll just wanna say that voice is a personal right patronage dividend, the right to benefit from the cooperative, uh, so benefit, well, get a part in the surplus, right, uh, is also personal right, but um, the ownership of capital uh, is not, it's, uh, it's collective. All right, dynamics and change. So that's the third aspect. So we have structures, we have processes, and the dynamics of change. Dynamics is really how the processes affect the, uh, the structures and vice versa, and where are those changes coming from? Or, or you know, how does dynamic change? How does the change happen? Um, in the complexity literature, uh, basically we talk about living organizations, and every organization is a living organization where people engage and communicate with each other. Uh, how are things done around here? Right. <laughs> That's basically what living organizations do. And so these changes are emergent changes. They are internal, that you have to have, or I guess they could be external if you have uh, continuous engagement of members that are external to the organization with the decision, decision making, but internally it makes perfect sense because you, know, you generate communications, uh, these are generated communications of workers in an enterprise on a daily basis. And these kinds of communications uh, actually uh, drive change. These are emergent properties of organizations. And then the question is, how can you formalize that uh, change uh, over time? Um, there's deliberative democratic processes in some cooperatives, and those would uh, cause certain uh, dynamics that uh, that instigate change. Uh, there could well, there's always collective problem solving. Uh, people in cooperatives or and in teams as many of us on the call know, uh, you know, you, you 
give each other ideas at the end you don't even know who said what but you know this is through this collective problem solving and brainstorming on, on issues uh, certain things evolve and, and changes are made there's conflict resolution processes that definitely also are an integral part especially of uh, people who are working closely together all the time that that's very important so conflict resolution processes then also cause certain changes um, and then there's stakeholder influence that uh, here I have external, uh, but of course it can also be worker influence uh, in consumer co-ops, so it could be internal. Um, and uh, isomorphism, largely external, but also could be internal. So what isomorphism means, uh, and again, many of you will be familiar with the term, it is when you mimic and copy practices of others. So, in, especially in times of uncertainty, um, we tend to copy processes or structures of others who are successful or we perceive them to be successful, right? So, Mondragon has been doing great and many other cooperative systems are trying to copy or you know, mod model what Mondragon has done uh, and so on. So, all of us involved, are involved in, in this uh, exchange of practices, but then sometimes those practices are not cooperative practices. And when that uh, kind of professional uh, bodies uh, impact what we do, um, you know, it can be uh, supportive of the cooperative enterprise structure and, and uh, business uh, model. And in some cases, it can actually uh, push a co-op away from the cooperative identity. Um, there are also consultants, of course, so depending on who we talk to and whether the consultants are, understand the cooperative business, uh, we can land on changes that may morph us into uh, something different. And so these are both dangerous, but also, uh, you know, in some cases, uh, supportive. So, so cooperative decision makers need to be pretty savvy on what kinds of practices to adopt. Um, another uh, aspect here that I want to mention just is that there is this uh, idea of cooperative reproduction. In other words, uh, onboarding new members. That's very, very important. Again, worker cooperatives know that well, and uh, SUMA comes to mind in the UK, uh, where new members actually have to spend quite a bit of time with, the, uh, with others uh, in, in the cooperative before they actually become full members. So it's not just do they do the job well, but it's also how do they fit into this collective? How do they, you know, can, can we work together uh, and so on? So it's very important to actually have values alignment uh, when you onboard new members, especially in work calls, but it's true for others as well. So who the new members are and how they fit into the organization, the organizational culture is very important. And this is what causes change and dynamics. Uh, heterogeneity of members. So diversity of members is known, especially in the uh, agricultural co-ops literature, uh, to be the cause of rift and the cause of problems. So it could be the case. All right. Sonia, um, um, yes. Sonia, I hate to, to, to butt in. Um, tell. But, um, uh, we, we only have 35 minutes left. Um, so I'm just wondering um, okay, I'm stretched I because I don't see the clock in front of me. So thank you for okay. barging in and I am going to wrap it up then. Uh, thank you. Yes. yes. So give me max five minutes. All right. So the implications of this humanistic paradigm is that uh, workers are not treated as property, that people have agencies in, work, in their workplaces, worker cops and solidarity multi-stakeholder co-ops satisfy the conditions of, humanistic par of the humanistic paradigm. But other kinds of cooperatives also deploy humanistic practices that we see uh, right out in the field. And this is where you hopefully will get a few minutes to discuss. Sorry about going over time here. Um, that humanism is in fact practiced in other kinds of cooperatives as well. So it's about treating people equitably and with respect, about ethical consumption production, about economic and social justice. And the question then is, how do co-ops engage their members and strategic stakeholders, who are workers, producers, and consumers, in crafting the vision for the enterprise? And so, 
the purpose of membership uh, will mm. impact greatly what the uh, governance structures will be. Why you know why you engage as a worker is for jobs, quality of work, control over work life, and so on. As a consumer, it's about access, fair pricing, and so on. So so how you engage with the co-op will mark the governance structures. And so I'll drive it down to a list, quick list of democratic structures that may help you think through the question that we'll put to you in a couple of minutes. So here's some of the possible structures. Um, indivisible reserves, a general assembly, of course, um, elected boards, member councils, workers councils, regional councils in some large co-ops, um, the multiple bo boards, advisory committees, circles in sociocracy, the executive team we think is a part of the governance structure because it's always the CEO who actually, or the executive team, it has drives the agenda and has to be on board with the vision of the enterprise. Um, coordinators forums and other, other structures that cooperatives put together in order to actually uh, meet their purpose. Uh, the processes are direct representative democracy, um, the sociocracy, as I said, because the majority vote consensus and so on. I mentioned uh, uh, quite a few of those. So for us, I'm wrapping up. For us, the next steps are to explore this contingent humanistic governance, uh, those practices in co-ops, identify structures and processes that are compatible with humanistic governance. And um, uh, we want to also address what uh, you know, long-term health for co-ops means and what governance solutions are fit for different types of co-ops. So that's what, where we're heading with the project. The upcoming events that I want to invite you to uh, take a look at is the International Co-op Alliance Congress and the research conference where not just this will be discussed but many other topics uh, because it's on the cooperative identity and there will be two publications. Uh, I'll share this with, uh, with the team uh, at the UK Society so if you are interested by all means you can get the information. Um, so the special issue on the of the Journal of Co-op Organization and Management is coming out on, on the co-op identity and uh, the review, the ICA review uh, of international cooperation. And then uh, our team in Halifax will have the symposium on cooperative governance in June next year. Hopefully we'll be able to travel by then. So thanking you for your time and uh, stamina. Uh, <laughs> I'm just showing who is supporting the project, which is again, a Belgian government grant. And here goes finally, the question to you. Uh, so in breakout rooms, I'm going to leave it to Richard here to organize us. Question is, how do humanistic theories of governance apply in your call? You can think of structures, of processes, or dynamics of change, but how do these humanistic theories apply in your call? So we are talking workers' control, engaging the stakeholders, having multiple boards and committees, multiple points of decision-making, focus on human dignity and well-being rather than uh, return on investment. So discussion on how these apply to your co-op and do you think they do? If they don't, why not? Thank you. Thank you so much.